It's with great delight that I introduce Sean Bowman to you from Alinta Energy. Sean is the Executive Director of People and Culture at Alinta, a position he has held since April 2011. He has 23 years experience in human resources, gained across a range of different industries within Australia and internationally. Prior to joining Alinta Energy, Sean worked at Unilever, initially as VPHR, Australasia from 2005 to 2007, then as Global Vice President of HR for the foods categories of Unilever from 2007 to 2011. This role is based in London, its responsibility for HR in 95 countries. Sean also worked at Lion, back then known as Lion Nathan from 2000 to 2005, initially as Resourcing Director and then as the HR Director for Lion Nathan Australia. During this time, Sean worked closely with Bob Barber. Some of you will have met him at various previous conferences on the early part of the transformation journey. Sean has a long history in association with human synergistics tools and approaches and is in the process of transforming Linter Energy, applying this knowledge and experience. Sean's presentation today is about the progress that has been made to date as the company gears up for its first full depth culture measure. Please welcome Sean Bowman. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk to you today about um, what we're going through at Alinter Energy. And uh, um, the first thing I'm going to do is tell you a little bit and very, very quickly about who Alinter Energy is. And for those who actually live in Perth and have gas supplied to their house, you probably do know who Alinter Energy is because you probably get a bill from us every now and then. But we're actually a much um, broader company than, than probably what a lot of people realise um, and that is that apart from having a very large residential gas business in, in Western Australia, we also have a number of other power stations across the country. Uh, most of those are gas-fired power stations. We also have uh, a, a coal-fired power station which supplies about 40% of the baseload electricity to South Australia and a coal mine that, that, uh, that supplies the coal for that uh, power station with a train line in between those two, about 300 kilometres of train. I'm, I'm telling you that because it'll be relevant later on in the presentation. Uh, we also have a, a, a wholesale trading desk uh, based in Sydney. And really, there's three components to, to our business. Um, we, we generate power, um, and, uh, and that will, is either power which su supplies base load to, to parts of the country like South Australia, or it's contracted to important uh, assets, say, in the Pilbara. So we have some contracted um, power generation in the Pilbara, and that's an important source of growth for the company going forward. We also trade electricity. As I said, that's based out of Sydney, and we retail both, both gas and we have an emerging uh, retail uh, electricity business in, in the east coast of Australia, particularly South Australia and Victoria. I want to tell you a little bit about the past of, of Alinta because it sets the context for what I'm going to talk to you about today, which is really our... Uh, the, the transformation journey that we're on to so far. Now, most people that come and talk to these sorts of conferences will tell you about their first OCI and then in the test and then the retest. And if they're an organisation that's had a long association with human synergistics, the test, retest and retest. We're unusual because we're coming to talk to a, pre a conference like this and we haven't even done an OCI yet. I'll explain why. Uh, we've done extensive uh, LSI across the organisation, um, but I'll explain why. But, but um, I, Sean asked me to, to present because he said that um, a, a lot of organisations are like us and they're setting out on a transformation journey. They haven't necessarily gone through the, the full sort of five to ten year uh, uh, journey. Um, and so the interest here was to, to talk about what we've done to date and what we're planning to do going forward and the progress that we've made. The start point is who we were um, going back in to, uh, prior to 2011. And... Apart from having a very solid residential gas business, uh, Alinta Energy has had historically, or Alinta as it was called back then, had historically been one of um, um, the unfortunate sort of uh, corporate soap operas um, and, and really uh, uh, you know, on the verge of being a casualty of the global financial crisis. In investment terms, it was what was known as a distressed asset. Um, it was on the verge of administration for, for a long period of time and, and ownership structures changed, particularly when, when Babcock and Brown went under during the, the, uh, the GFC. The classic definition of, of administration is that you're struggling to make enough uh, cash to pay the interest on your loans. And Sean right up front today spoke about the more short term you get, the, the greater the, you know, the, 
the, well, the, the relationship between short-termism and culture. And so you can imagine what the culture was like back then when every single month the company was struggling to, to generate enough cash to pay the interest on loans. And imagine what that does to how you run a business. Everything gets optimised for cash. You have to make a decision. Do I, do I, make, do I maintain this facility? I, do I even take a, a one-year perspective on whether I should be investing in this facility? Because that involves cash, and if I do that, I could go under next month. So we're about, back then, and prior to 2011, probably about as short-term as you could get. Now, what happened in 2011 it was, was, was that the ownership of the organisation changed. And, and essentially, it was a private equity uh, debt for, for equity transactions. I, a series of private equity companies and banks took over the debt in return for ownership. Um, now, there's a number of private equity firms, but the lead firm is, is TPG, and that's not the telecommunications company, that's, that's Texas Pacific Group, which is uh, a leading private equity firm. They're, they're the actual managing um, private equity firm, so they have a management contract with us, and we, we, we deal with all the other private equity firms through them. When I, so I, I came to, to join the company in, in March 2011, um, and this was seriously what it was like back then. There was no single identity in the company. The company had eight, eight or more uh, locations scattered around, different personalities. Virtually none of them uh, spoke, spoke to each other, and really what they were doing was, as I said before, adding up the cash across those various locations to see if, as, a, as an organisational unit, we could uh, meet our, our debt obligations. The, there was a complete lack of, of, of senior leadership visibility in the company, and you could probably understand why. And that's, you know, the CEO couldn't afford to, 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 to leave... Uh, head office um, because of the, of the, and it was working around the clock basically to keep the, the company afloat. At that point in time we had protracted EBA negotiations and we really did treat our people as the enemy to be outmaneuvered when it came to EBA negotiations. Um, by the time I joined we'd spent something like $300,000 on lawyers trying to outmaneuvre um, our, our workforce, you know, so if, if they tried to take any form of industrial action or any industrial trick we'd have them in court straight away. Now, I did point out the time when I joined, and, and when I make these comparisons, I'm, I'm, I, I want to be clear, I'm not being critical of the past, right, because the organisation was in a certain context at that point in time, and it, and it had to be managed in a certain way, given that context. Didn't, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I'm not critical of it. And, but I did make the point that, you know, as we go to transform the organisation, treating our people as, as, a, as a unit to be outmaneuvered was not the path to greatness. And I actually asked my EA manage, ER manager at the time, who who's, you know, has joined another company since, I said, you name, think of the great organisations in the world. And are they great because they have the world's best EBA? And we go to transform this organisation through industrial relations instruments. And she didn't know what the hell I was talking about, but because but, you know, she just was, was so framed around this is what we needed to do. And she had a, a clearly articulated strategy that had to be executed. So... The, I didn't put this up because I think we're a good-looking bunch, by the way. The, we all joined at the same time, the exec team. And, and the reason why that's critical is that, again, going back to Sean's earlier comments about the relationship between having a longer-term focus beyond the next quarter, I've got two significant advantages. Firstly, having a, an exec team that started at all the same time is just brilliant. There's no one saying, we tried that three years ago and it didn't work. There's no one on the exec team trying to protect the past or through some association that they had with previous decisions. We all were in it together. We all had the same objective, um, and we all had the, the same mandate to transform the organisation. The other advantage I have is that whilst, whilst private equity can have separate set of challenges in that your shareholder is often inside your business, and when things are going well, they, they have certain types of conversations with you as opposed to when things are going not so well, um, the other advantage is that they share the same aspirations as you as an exec team. So private equity's normal approach is to try and get about a, a three times return on their investment over a five-year period. That's a rough guide. But that's usually why they go into, into these types of arrangements. So when, you're, when you have the same aspirations as your shareholder, it, it allows you to take a long view. If you're, if you're publicly listed, then you, you, you do have to manage that dynamic of the fact that You've got some shareholders that are going short on you. They're looking for a return in the next quarter. You've got some 
like Warren Buffett, that might have a very long view on you. But you don't have universality of, of, of aspiration around what, what, uh, what you're trying to do with that company. So very quickly, you know, what, what, what we did was take the three times uh, multiple um, for, for exit and turn that into an, EBIT, an EBITDA target. And roughly we, what we said was, well, if you use a 10 times EBITDA multiple, um, you know, what would that deliver in terms of a return on investment? And so we set that target. And basically what that actually meant was it doubled the business. And that wasn't just a, often you hear executives say, we're going to double this or triple this. It actually was some science behind how we came up with that, with that number. Then we turned that EBITDA target into a series of other targets, which I won't go through there, other than to highlight that, that at that point in time, engagement was the key HR measure, and I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, I've sort of spoken about this already, but when you're going to transform an organisation, when you're going to turn it around from week, week on week survival to doubling it in a five year period, there's two things that are certain. The first is that seismic, not incremental, seismic cultural change is required. You know, I really felt a sense that the the clock was ticking the day that I joined. We had to start doing things now and doing things differently. You can't just turn an organisation around incrementally in terms of culture if you're going to go from one shift to another, if you're going to go from survival to growth, if you're going to go from despair to opportunity, if you're going to shift your organisation and all your HR practices around retaining people and ensuring they don't spend money to achievement. And so... Really, from, from that perspective, when I, when I first joined, I met, you know, the very first day I went round, met the CEO, said hello, and said it was, you know, it was great that I had joined. I went round to my desk, sat down. I had a computer with no emails on it, which is a thing of joy and beauty. I had a, and, and I had basically a desk with no paper in it. Um, and I thought, wow, um, what do we need to do here? So literally, this was a genuine clean sheet of paper exercise. I pulled out a piece of paper and started to say, well, what do we need to do across every front of, of HR? And really, the key in the f initially was, was to get all the basics in place in the first 100 days. And this really had to be quick. You know? And so that we looked at every single um, you know, aspect of, of all, all the HR tools that you would need to have you know, for a high-performing organisation. And when I say quick, these were all put in place within 100 days. With a real perspective that, um, you, you know, my view is that you can try and come up with the, with the ideal performance management system and, and employ some consultants and work on that for, you know, a year and, and engage every stakeholder in the process. Um, or you can largely know what's going to work, get it in place quick and refine later. And that really was the theme across all of these things. So we, did, we put a performance management in place, system in place, put a talent management system in place. We completely revised our recruitment. The business had a funny approach to recruitment when we joined. Um, we, had, uh, we were using um, approximately 64 different recruitment agencies across the company. Um, we now have one or two preferred supply arrangements, but we mostly do it ourselves. Um, what went on in the first three months, three to six months, I suppose, was a massive overhaul of talent. And you could understand why that would be necessary in the context that I was talking about. I mentioned that 100% of the exec team changed. In terms of the, the direct reports, 50% of those people changed in the first six months and 30% overall across the company. So it was a massive churn of talent. And I tell you, when you're in this, in this environment, you have to sort of go with it but not let go, right? So, you know, if you can imagine a, a, about this level of recruitment that's going on, was there the potential for remuneration inconsistencies? Absolutely. I mean, how on earth could you be across all of this when it's happening? Um, but equally, you know, if we didn't, for instance, we, we, we moved our trading desk from uh, Brisbane to, to Sydney, um, and that basically meant we replaced all 30 traders. Now, you can't actually operate as an energy company unless you've got a trading team, uh, like legally. So, you know, we had, to, we had to move quickly in terms of getting that, that talent in place, but, so we had to be overseeing it, but, but also being a little bit relaxed initially about what was going on because speed was critical. The key thing around the PNC team, um, and about half of the PNC team that was there when I joined is still there today, but really the key criteria about whether they were going to make the transition was, was in this space. I mean, really we had to shift away from 
po you know, policing and policy control, which again was probably the right mode when the company's on the verge of administration. You probably want to make sure that people aren't spending money they shouldn't be spending. You know, and to give you an example, my, my, most of my HR team, you know, I've just sort of spoken about the company profile, massive business in Western Australia, you know, reasonable business in, 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 in South Australia and Sydney, and, you know, but all of the HR team was pretty much based in Adelaide. Not ideal, but even less ideal was the fact that they'd never travelled. They weren't allowed to travel because of the cost. Um, they weren't allowed to have mobile phones either. Um, and that was an indication of what the, what the organisation was like back then. And so I had to get that PNC team out of the policing mode into how do we transform the organisation mode. Um, and part of that was courageous leadership um, because there's so much going on at the, and at the time. We, we had to move out of this notion that we were just responded to what the business told us to do to, have to, to how we were actually going to lead a cultural uh, uh, cha transformation within the company. Like most organisations, we started off with a sense of purpose and, and values. Uh, again, my insight here, we, we, these were developed within and implemented within three months, um, probably even quicker. The key thing around values, and I, you've probably heard this before, I, I think if you took the top 200 companies in the world and aggregated all of their values, you'd probably end up with a list of maybe 20, 15 to 20. Um, so again, you can spend a lot of time formulating values, or you could write those 20 values down and say to your CEO, which ones do you think are going to work best for us? Which is effectively what we did. We actually came up with seven. Then I said to my CEO at the time, well, we can't have seven. And he said, why? And I said, because people won't remember the sixth and the seventh. That's always the case. People remember five. I don't know if there's any behavioral science behind that, but it's just my own personal experience. And so we basically said, well, safety is number critical, obviously, for a business of our nature, between mines and power stations, so that was a given. Also, given the, what I said before about the organisation being quite disparate and, and not connected, the, the sense of teamwork or one or into was going to be quite critical. So those two, we said, we're going to have those. We took the other five and we went, you know, and I had a process of going around the organisation to, to get input as to what the remaining three should be out of that five. And that, that's what we came up with, which was customer focus, integrity and leadership. I have to say the values landed very, very quickly, particularly the first two, particularly the first two. Um, and Wonderlinda had a, a lot of resonance right across the organisation and became quite important. There is always this definition, what, what is, you know, are these values, are they really codes of conduct or are they behaviours or whatever? They were probably as much as anything at that point in time statements about what, how we wanted to see the culture change. We wanted to see safety culture was critical. We wanted to see more collaboration across the organisation. If we were going to enter new markets in, in South Australia, if we were going to potentially confront um, maybe contestability in Western Australia, which we're now confronting, customer focus needed to be an important value, etc. Um, so when we got the foundations in place, when we had all the, all the systems in place, which, and this is sort of post 100 days now, the key thing is what, how do we start to transform the culture? And this is where we started to put the, the longer term plan in place. And effectively we put a framework um, in place which um, we're still largely operating to now. So it is, it is a, really a five-year or four-year plan around how we want to transform the culture in the organisation. And, and pretty much everything we've done has been quite deliberate around this plan. We operate a simple framework, which is really you know, talent, culture and engagement. We, th we think that engagement's an output of culture, just, just to be clear, but we, we sort of articulate it this way to the business just so that there's clarity around what we do. But, we do lots of other things, but we say we're going to add value by ensuring we have great people in the organisation who are behaving in the way which is going to be consistent with our aspirations in a constructive way, um, who also are passionate about our business and want to strive, which is essentially talent, culture and engagement. I mean, we believe that you, know, you can actually have talented people um, who actually like what they do but are not behaving the right way. You know, no disrespect to the public service, you can actually have that sometimes. You can have people that that are talented, um, love, what, love their job, but the underlying culture is bureaucratic and therefore it, it impacts on, you know, and vice versa, you can sort of change the equation. So we, we try and focus the organisation around those three themes and we believe that the sort of centrepiece of that is, is, is high achievement. This is basically the plan that we put in place back then. Um, now, I really wanted to do an OCI right up front. I, that, I, that was, you know, all my experience with HS um, over the years, and it dates back to about 1996, 
all of my experience through Lion, through seeing you know, the impact that the tools made in Unilever, et cetera, I had a real desire to start with an OCI, but you know, decided not to. And the reason was twofold. Firstly, I described what, and I wish I had it, by the way, because I, I would love to be doing the test retest now, frankly, but let me talk about that later. The, the reason why we didn't was that at the time, there was a hell of a lot going on in the organisation. You can imagine the first three to six months, particularly all that talent change, but everything that was going on in terms of the initial stages of transformation. For me to, to have tried to, to land the OCI at that point in time with that much going on, I, don't, I didn't believe it would have, would have been as effective as, 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 as what it should have been or could have been. So we decided to lead with engagement. As I said before, I believe engagement is an output of culture. So our plan was to always to influence the culture. But engagement was at least a score in the door. It's a one number. Private equity understands it. The board could get their head around it. I didn't have to try and explain you know, achievement, humanistic encouraging, et cetera. I could just get this in place. Then we could work on culture behind the scenes uh, and then influence, by influencing culture through leadership, we could have engagement as the key output. So that was the initial plan. And then once that had landed, we could then introduce OCI and then start to drive things through culturally, which is what the plan we're working towards. So we did the initial engagement survey back in, in 2011. That was the first survey we did. Um, and then the plan was to then start to influence leadership in the organisation to drive a constructive culture by rolling out, firstly, an, an articulation about what our expectations of behaviour would be in terms of leadership through a leadership program, and then conducting... Uh, LSIs for those leaders and then rolling out LSI right across the organisation. And then, then a commitment to, to retest on LSI annually. Um, then with the LSI in place right across the organisation, with everybody understanding the language around blue, red and green behaviour, with that vernacular embedded in the organisation, there's a clear platform to roll out the OSI. In fact, this OCI. In fact, there's more than a clear platform, there's a real desire. People now want to. There's a huge demand for it. They want to see what, what the organisation's culture looks like because of the path we've followed. That's why, as I said right up front, we haven't actually done the OCI yet, but we are doing it in, in November. So in terms of what our engagement, just to talk about that just quickly, back in 2011, not surprising, it was very, very low. It was only three months after the, you know, the, the change in ownership, it was 33%. Um, for those that are familiar with, with Aon Hewitt, who we use, you know, that's just above what they call the destructive zone. And in reality, because of the churn in talent, it probably was in you know, something like 25%, assuming we hadn't recruited disengaged people. And, we, and I don't think we did. Um, so the, it was very low. And so the initial plan was, OK, well, if we're going to drive engagement as an output, what are the things we need to do? And the first thing was obviously address the drivers of, that came out in the engagement survey. But the usual, you know, the things that actually make a big impact, um, and I don't think there's a lot of massive insight into an action plan like this. It's all about the execution, and it's about the execution in the context of what type of culture you're trying to, to establish in the organisation. So you can have a commitment to CEO roadshows, et cetera, et cetera, but if you're not reinforcing the desired culture, if you're not really clear about that, then you can have a CEO that goes around and says a whole pile of funny things um, or things that are not necessarily, and I've been in that situation, by the way, um, where I, I held my breath every time the CEO got up on stage. But if you're actually really clear about what type of culture you're trying to embed in the organisation, you can appropriately frame those, those roadshows and those key communication events, and they've had enormous impact. Um, they really, really have. When I mentioned 33% engagement, there's, there's two other stats I want to give you. The first one is 21% uh, engagement, which was the engagement score at our mine in Lee Creek, and 23%, which was the engagement score at our power station in Port Augusta. Right, so you combine that, that's roughly about 22% across those two sites, roughly, because they're about equal. Um, that essentially was the engagement of our blue-collar workforce. And so the first time we got up on stage and rolled out you know, the engagement results. And by the way, private equity are going, why on earth would you want to do this? Why would you want to go and tell everyone how much they, they don't like the company? Um, and we have to say, look, you know, we've got to actually, firstly, we survey people, but we want to put a stake in the ground and talk about what we're going to do differently. But going to sites where there's 20% engagement, you know, in a sea of uh, fluoro vests and, and goat beards and folded arms, 
was quite an intimidating environment. Right? And, but it's interesting, and true story, um, went to Lee Creek, um, and as long as, you know, and the key insight here very early on was, as long as the messages were authentic, they might not agree with them. If there was any sense that you're going to bullshit people, then they, there was a high, you know, basically they'll, 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 they'll eject though whoever was saying those messages pretty, pretty quickly. But, but provided there was an authentic, authenticity around the message, even though they didn't, they didn't agree with it necessarily, they listened. And this bloke came up to me afterwards and said, oh, you know all that stuff you're talking about engagement? I thought, oh, here we go. And he goes, well, I've been here 26 years. And I went, yeah, <laughs> to myself, by the way, not to him. And then he said, um, he said well, I reckon you've got something going there. And uh, this lot will take a, a bit of time to turn around. But you keep going at that and do, do what you said. And over time, they'll turn around. And, you know, it's, it's little moments like that that make road shows worth it, right? And I just want to put a stake in the ground around that comment. Um, I think the key thing that we did was, was, uh, was, was the launch of the leadership program and the rollout of the LSI. There's no doubt you know, that the LSI has had a massive impact in the organisation. The leadership program was also critical because it packaged up everything we wanted to achieve around building an achievement culture. And of course the challenge is in the absence of these things, people bring to work their version of what leadership is. And their version of what leadership is can be derived from various sources, from their cultural background, from leaders that they've worked from, from the companies that they've been to. And if those companies had a constructive culture, their leadership was probably going to be good. If their, um, uh, if their culture that the company that they came from wasn't, then there's was, was a fair chance it was going to be destructive. But what was clear was that if you've got all these versions of leadership battling with each other in a, in a company, you've got a problem, right? So you've actually got to put a stake in the ground and say, this is the leadership expectations we have, and here is the feedback we're going to give to you about how you sit today versus that, 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 that level of expectation. And like every company that launches LSI and OCI, you have an argument about whether, you know, sorry, you don't have an argument, you have an exchange of, 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 of discussion around whether you know, I think red behaviour really does deliver results or what's, what's wrong with conventional behaviour, we need to follow the rules here, aren't we a safety company, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So you, you deal with all of those and talk about the fact, well, you know, we talk about a safety culture, we don't talk about a, the best set of safety rules in the world, don't we? So you, you do start to influence the way that people think about culture. So we did all of that. Here's some of the things that, we, that people said uh, right up front. Um, you'll never improve uh, engagement unless bonuses are paid. Uh, you can't improve the engagement of blue-collar workers um, and that higher engagement lags company results. It's not a lead indicator, it's a lag. So when the company starts performing, then people will be engaged. Of course, we all know that they're not true. So how did we go in year one? We, we, st we started doing all these things. We had the basics of HR in place. We started to launch the L LSI and, and, uh, and, and the ACI. We had a big, strong uh, uh, approach around communication. We started to put in place KPI setting, etc. Well, it was a train smash. Quite, quite literally. Now we had four of these in the first year. Four of these. Four derailments. We also had numerous outages at our power station in, in Port Augusta. And the combined performance of those two units lost to $70 million. $70 million loss. And really, in year one, everything that could go wrong went wrong. We had two 100 year floods uh, spaced about three weeks apart. Um, which basically turned our mine in, in Lee Creek into a great big mud pit. Um, we had the coldest, the coldest summer on record in South Australia where, where the power station supplies power. You know, and so we were, because of the performance of the, of, the, of the power station, we were actually unhedged in the market, which meant that we were heavily exposed and we made huge losses as a result. And so you can see... Um, about where the, the last grey call-out is, the Lee Creek floods, you can see that what had actually happened in terms of business results. We'd gone backwards in that first year. And the reason why we did go backwards was all the pipeline impact. You can't not invest in a business over a sustained period of time, change your ownership, and then th think everything is going to turn around. But these are all the things we were doing from a people and culture perspective during that time. Now, I think to that short-term versus long-term perspective, if we were publicly listed and we had a year like that in year one, there is no way could we, I don't, we would have struggled, let me say it this way, we would have struggled to continue with a longer term plan when we, when we had a hailstorm going on. But because we had a longer term view of the business, we were able, we, we were able to 
and private equity sharing the same aspirations as us. Five, this is a five-year plan. Yes, it was fixed today's issues, and there's no doubting that, but it was also how do we actually continue to build for the future. So I mentioned the leadership program. I think this had a, probably the biggest impact in terms of shifting the, the culture of the organisation, um, and of course the launch of the LSI, which I mentioned. Now, when we retested in, in June 2012, um, in spite of the fact that the results had gone backwards in the business, in terms of EBITDA, engagement had improved dramatically. So there goes that, you know, you won't improve engagement unless bonuses are paid. No one got a bonus. We missed budget. We hit 75% of our, of our budget in terms of EBITDA. But we had a dramatic improvement in engagement. And, and the key thing is that that is the reinforcement. And, and we knew then at that point in time that the early efforts around shifting leadership and shifting culture were influencing the outcome of engagement. Every driver of engagement improved. So we really did see right across the range uh, you know, excellent results around what we were doing in our people practices. So things started to turn around. After that first year of EBITDA results, all the things we were doing to shift the culture of the organisation, along with the, you know, really getting really clear about the quality of our strategy, etc., started to, to change the business's performance. The first thing we started to do, and I won't go through this in any detail, but the key point here was we made some key strategic decisions about how we manage the assets. Um, and those decisions, which basically was to run the power station in South Australia only when it made money. That might, you know, might sound, well, why wouldn't you just do that anyway? But a whole pile of reasons why power stations, when they're baseloaded, typically run over a whole year. We decided to, to only run it when it made money, which was the six months of the year, which also allowed us to, to, to maintain the power station, to get, do a complete overhaul to make sure that it did operate effectively. When a power station operates effectively, then you can appropriately contract in the market and you're not exposed to as, as much as you normally would be or we were in year one to, a very, to temperatures and summers and those sorts of things. You've got a much better hedge position. In order to do that though, we had to go to that workforce that I was telling you about that initially had 21% engagement and say to them, we need you to make some, some different uh, decisions. Uh, sorry, we need to engage you around how we're going to run this business differently. And rather than, again, try and take them to court and, and pursue a different set of EA terms, industrial, um, sorry, enterprise bargaining terms, we actually went on a, on a change program with them. Um, and we had an ongoing efforts around engaging them around how we would need to run this power station, how we would need to run this mine in order for us to have a medium and long-term future. Now, we, the mine in Lee Creek is a mine... It, 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 you know, the, the town of Lee Creek is basically we own. It exists because of the mine, right? That mine closes, the town disappears, and the whole community goes, goes away. This group of people have a, a, a very strong interest in, in what actually, um, in, in the performance of the business. It's just that they had never been engaged in it before. And in fact, as I said, we treated them as the enemy. So actually working with them on the solution meant that something quite unusual happened. We'd spent three years in a protracted EBA negotiation around a 16% increase, 4% over four years. In three months through this change management process, this group of employees voted 75% approval to actually drop their pay by 16% in terms of shift changes. Three months to get them to take a, a pay cut, because, and they made that decision because it was their decision about what they needed to do in order to ensure that the mine had longevity. And so you can see the, the power of actually engaging engaging people who actually feel ownership of, of the company. We started to launch recognition programs across the organisation um, and we started to see the, uh, the, 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 the turnaround in business performance. And you can see there, this is the, the ongoing uh, PNC sort of plan that we, were, that we were implementing. Very, very much focused on change management in our, in our power station and, and, and uh, uh, in, in South Australia in our mine. Um, a lot of effort around KPI setting, a lot of effort around that, making sure there was real line of sight between what people did and, and the organisation's strategy. And so much of what the CEO did in these roadshows was get real clarity about what the strategy of the organisation was. And everyone, everyone right across the entire organisation um, is very clear about what the strategy of the company is. 
and, and, and through our efforts around KPI setting, really clear about the line of sight between what it is they do and how it influences the, the company's results. So by the time we finished the leadership program, we'd actually conducted about 180 LSIs across our leadership group. We've got about 800 employees in total. As I said, half of those are, are sort of blue collar workers. Um, and then we rolled out a, what was called a one day version of that leadership program. So all the same um, perspectives around culture. The leadership program was a two day program. Um, that particular program, which we called the achievement program, um, we rolled out to everybody basically who, who, uh, who wasn't on the EBA, um, which is about a th you know, another 420 people. It, it actually went to some people who were on the EBA, by the way, as well. So I ran uh, achievement programs in Port Augusta where we had actually people who were on the EBA attending the program, doing an LSI. So by the end of this, we had another 420 people who had conducted, had an LSI conducted. And as I said, we're now one year on, we're going through the retest of that and we're seeing the progress that people are making around their leadership style. Now the business fundamentals are shifting dramatically. So don't need to understand that slide other than to say that the power stations now operate significantly better and they operate at international standards. Not only do they operate at international standards, but when we had an outage before, it might take us two weeks to get the facility up and running again. Now we're talking sometimes six hours, eight hours. So our, our ability to actually uh, respond. Um, and look, you can't underestimate the importance of engagement and culture in that. You know, I remember standing at the, at the mine in Lee Creek, I mean, watching an excavator um, dig out coal. Now, we, we, we've got, the coal mine in Lee Creek has got a, a strip ratio of about eight to one. You've got to remove eight, eight tons of dirt to get to one ton of, of coal. And then that coal is variable. And you've got somebody who's, who's working in 55 degrees in, the, in a coal pit um, with an excavator uh, digging up coal. And that coal can be high quality or low quality. Now, the degree to which they care about the organisation has a massive impact. Because if they don't really care, this is just a job they're trying to get through. They'll just dig up whatever crap comes out. And then it's got to get sorted and graded. And that has all sorts of cost implications. If they're really focused on, on, on digging the best quality coal every time that excavator goes into the ground, that has a massive impact on the performance of the unit. So if you've treated that person as an enemy for, for 20 years, you can see how much discretionary effort they're going to apply in terms of what they're going to dig out of the ground versus if they feel like this is their business, they feel ownership, and they want to do their best for the company. And that's why you start to see um, much higher productivity due to the, the fact that we had actively engaged those, those groups of people. So as, as, the financial to, as, a, as all of these things kicked in, we started to see the, the lag effect, which is the financial outcomes of, of, of what we were doing around people and culture. Which meant that when, in year one, as I said, we, we uh, declined, our, we achieved about 75% of our EBITDA target. In year two, we've almost doubled it. So we've all, we almost, last year had an almost a doubling of EBITDA, which is a phenomenal result. You know, it really is. And, and when you think about what's going on in the energy sector generally, that is massively outstripping our peer, our peer groups who, you know, and, and we're on a trajectory now that's, that, that, that puts us back on plan to, to achieving the doubling of the business. In fact, if, we have a, if things go as they are this year, we'll be going beyond just um, a, 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 that plan and starting to exceed the the year-on-year -year targets that private equity have in place for us to double the business over that five-year period. Then we got our engagement score about three weeks ago. Remember the first one was 33, second year was 47, we're now at 64%. Um, now the, again, that's a massive increase. Um, and the thing is, and by the way, we had 89% participation right across the workforce, that included Lee Creek, Port Augusta, every, everybody, 89%. So it's not, there's no weighting of people in this, in this engagement survey. That's, that's a very hard result, 64%. The stat I want to give you, I mentioned that Lee Creek was 21%. It's now at 60%. We have a coal mine at 60% engagement. Um, this are, these are, as I said, blue collar workers, sometimes working you know, shift work through the night, certainly often working in extremely hot temperatures, who took a 16% pay cut, whose engagement has now gone up to 60% and we have Port Augusta at 53%. We have our EBA population now at 55% engagement, as opposed to 22%, which I mentioned up front. And we've got EBA negotiations 
EBA negotiations coming up. Imagine how those negotiations are going to go when you've got 55% engagement as opposed to 22. So all of this has now led us to a brilliant situation where we can uh, launch the OCI. Um, because now we have a, a scenario where we're clear about at least that our efforts around cultural change and building an achievement culture in the organisation uh, are, are at least impacting on the outcome of, of engagement. We can now in, uh, talk to the business around how we build culture. LSI is embedded in the organisation. As I said, it's a vernacular that everyone understands. People talk about red behaviour or blue behaviour, they, they reflect on themselves. We now have a scenario where we can launch the OCI and there's so much demand for it, you know, it, 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 will, it will actually have the, the sort of the real impact that we'd be looking for it to have. And we're going to continue the cycle. We're going to do the, the, the next version of the leadership program, which will, which will kick off um, uh, February, March next year. So what have we learned so far? Now, I mentioned five years. In, in about 10 days' time, even less actually, um, five days' time will be exactly two and a half years through. So it's almost like half time in the, in the, in the five-year journey. So we're not there yet, and it is transformation in progress, right? Um, and, but we are working to a long-term plan. We're really clear about what, the role that people and culture plays in the delivery of that plan. And the things that I've learned so far is that, firstly, speed is critical. We've been able to do things. If, if, the interesting thing is, if you've got a long-term perspective on the business, you can actually move faster. And I know that sounds a bit strange, but it's totally true. Because we were clear about what it is we wanted to do, and there was alignment around that, internally and externally, you can move fast. And really, the key thing here was, you know, don't be too perfectionistic. You know, get things in place that you know will work, and if you need to tweak and refine, do that, rather than working for the perfect solution and taking too much time. Talent management story is obviously critical. It's, 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 you know, if you're going to transform an organisation, you've got to ensure you have the right talent and the talent aligned to, you know, both in terms of capability and leadership that is going to deliver your transformation plan. Communication, particularly alignment between the strategy and what people do every day is fundamental. Um, I think we've done a good job on, on really getting, and this, is, this came through in the engagement survey, we've done a good job in terms of how we align expectations of achievement in the organisation. People are clear and we're getting better at how rigorous people are and, in, and, and how th that rigour is, is calibrated across the organisation. So that's working well. But of course the thing that's been underpinning all of this is the transformation that we've had in leadership. And that's where the LSI has been absolutely fundamental. In, in, in putting a vernacular into the organisation and setting real clear expectations around uh, leadership behaviour in the organisation and giving people the opportunity to align their development around those expectations. And now, we're, because we're doing the retest, we're now starting to see the impact that that's having. I haven't seen a profile yet that's gone backwards. So some have, some have absolutely transformed. Some have got you know, a little bit better, but nothing's actually stagnated or gone backwards yet, which is, which is really positive. And of course, we're, you know, we're all looking forward to the, to the OCI now in, in November. Thank you very much. Mm.